welcome to the channel everybody appreciate you guys coming and checking it out we have something special for you today we have the story of bigfoot bodies being found dead and alive after the mount saint helens eruption in 1980. now i have a story from a person whose father was working there and then i have also two other reports one by an air force airman and one by a national guardsman so you guys stick with me and we're gonna get right to this. This is super, super interesting. So let's get to it. My father worked for Weyerhaeuser Company at Green Mountain, Washington, east of Vancouver. The site has security on the roads to check on the equipment and check closed areas to keep people out. My father was working the day Mount St. Helens blew up. He was at a meeting in Kelso, Washington and as he was a supervisor, when Mount St. Helens blew its side out, all heck cut loose. My father was sent back to Green Mountain right away, but like most, he wasn't allowed to go very far because of the mudslide coming down the river. He did get to the town of Tootle, Washington on Highway 504 off of I-5. He and his crew were placed at different spots to watch mud flow and, of course, help people get out of the blast zone after the major blow-up. He was sent to the area of Spirit Lake to keep people out. When the second major blow-up of the mountain came, my father and the other guy with him reported in, and then they got out of there. He was then placed in charge of the helicopter landing zone. It was his job to keep people out of the landing zone and let aid crews in so they could care for the injured. Later, when all the people were out and bodies out, the National Guard was brought in to clean up. They hauled dead animals out that they placed in piles, deer in one, elk in another, and so on. They were covered up with tarps and later burned. But my father was placed in charge of one pile of dead that were covered and no one was allowed to go near. Armed United States National Guard personnel were around this pile. And one day when they were going to move this group of bodies and my father was very close to it and was told to keep his mouth closed. And when the tarps were removed, he saw the creatures. Some badly burned and some not. They placed them in a net and lifted them into a truck, covered it over. My father asked the guardsman what they will do with them, and he said study them or whatever. He didn't want to know. He said it's like other things you just don't ask. And off they went, and no one knows what happened to them. My father and the rest were debriefed and sent home. So that's the first story about the Bigfoot bodies there at Mount St. Helens. Now we're going to get into a National Guardsman story here and this one is really really crazy wait till you guys hear this one i was a national guardsman at the mount st helens site and this is the first time i ever spoken about what i saw firsthand i lived in spokane washington and was 24 at the time this all took place i was placed on a special cleanup crew further up the mountain a large tent was set up and it was to be guarded by armed soldiers who were not part of the national guard there were numerous soldiers on the scene that were not members of the guard. We were given a briefing by a soldier who said that after he spoke to us, we would forget about him and what he said at the end of the mission. This was strange as we never dealt with anything like this before. Myself and four other guardsmen were told to follow a group of soldiers and not to speak to each other and to remain very quiet overall. We were told to get into a Jeep and wait. We sat in the Jeep for maybe a half an hour Eventually, another jeep arrived carrying a civilian and another member of the military. The civilian was brought into the tent and he emerged a few minutes later followed by a large, hairy creature. It looked like a large man covered in fur and the best way to describe it was like Beast from X-Men, only brown. This creature looked to have some burns and had a bandage on its arm. At first, we were afraid, but when it walked by, we could see its eyes, and it just looked very sad and somber. He climbed into the back of the pickup with the civilian, and the two were speaking in a weird language I had never heard. It would cough at times. We followed a truck to different areas. There were five total stops. Each time we stopped, we were told to follow the civilian and the creature. Each time we followed them to rocky areas where there were caves. The creature would make a sound and then listen. first area he made a sound and we all just waited in silence. After a few minutes the creature looked at the civilian and then at the ground. The civilian at one point touched his shoulder and called for a canteen to give the creature a drink. 
The same thing happened at the next area, but this time there was a response to the sound. After a few minutes, two soldiers emerged from the cave carrying a badly burned creature just like the one with the civilian. The creature bent down next to it and looked at it over for about five minutes. It then spoke softly with the civilian. It turned and walked back to the truck and we were told to follow. As we were walking away, we heard a shot and we knew it was one of the soldiers putting the creature out of its misery. Wow. There was no response at the third or fourth sight, but at the fifth there was another return sound to the creature. This time it was different and soldiers carried out a creature with a badly burned left leg. We were then ordered to all help get the very large stretcher from the truck and help place the creature on it and carry it back to the truck. We then immediately returned to the base camp. The creature was carried into the tent while the other creature and the civilian spoke. We were ordered to stay in the jeep until we were to be debriefed. As the creature turned to walk into the tent, it looked at us and made a waving gesture with his hand. We took it as a thank you for what we had done. By the time we were ordered out of the jeep, we were all in shock. We were called over to an area to be debriefed, and it was just strange. I will never forget what was said because it was just not what was expected. I thought I would hear, listen, you took an oath, and now you need to live up for it for your country, with a threat also implied. A different high-ranking soldier just said, look, do you all really want an explanation? You saw what we were doing. These creatures do live in these areas. They mean no harm and want to be left alone. Do you really want to do anything that may cause them any trouble? They are like us in a lot of ways. If you need or want to talk about this, just wait about 30 years. By that time, there will be likely no reason to keep them a secret. We were then ordered back to the guard camp because they were breaking it up so nobody saw too much and knew everything that happened. We did not speak of it, and after a few months, I just took the attitude that these things live out there, and honestly, my life is no different because of it. I only bring it up now because people have been writing a lot about the Mount St. Helens, and I believe that the whole story should be told. I will also say this. I like to camp and hike and have done so many times throughout the Northwest. Every time I would look for signs of these creatures, tracks, listens for sounds, etc. I never saw or heard anything other than what I did that day on Mount St. Helens. Wow, that was crazy right there. Imagine that. Imagine like seeing like a civilian, like probably a Indian language guy communicating with a creature and like helping the creature off finding these other badly burnt Sasquatches. Wow, that would be crazy. Now I have something else for you from an Air Force Airman. So let's get to this. I was an airman in the Air Force in the 1980s. I was stationed at George Air Force Base from the late 70s to the early 80s. Our mission was the Wild Weasels or Air Force F-4s that would go into a war area before it started like the first Gulf War at low level and pop up and then light them up on the ground to air defenses and then shoot anti-radiation missiles at the sites letting the other aircraft get in. In 1980, we were shipped to train with the Canadian forces at Comex CFB on Vancouver Island. We took a C-141 from George to Canada. Our C-141 had an in-flight emergency and we had to land at Travis Air Force Base in Northern California for repair. We were losing hydraulic fluid in one engine and I saw the crewman come back and dump several cans of hydraulic fluid into the reservoir and it just went back to zero. He had a parachute and we didn't. Kind of made me nervous. But we later got back on our way and flew over St. Helens right after it blew its top. Once we got to Comex, our officer in charge told us we would be there for longer than the two weeks due to an emergency mission that they needed help on. We were all specialized airmen trained in different specialties in aircraft maintenance and repair. But we were soldiers first and we did lots of other stuff that our country needed. We were there for a couple days not doing anything because as I look back, they were trying to figure out how to use us. Then we all got on a bus and we were bused to an area around the south end of the island and were picked up on a strange naval ferry. I was never in the Navy so I don't know anything about boats but our bus was tied down and delivered to the United States side and we drove off. It was under darkness and it was typically cloudy and rainy as we continued our bus ride to the disaster area. We were given M16s and one mag. 
which I found fascinating because most Air Force enlisted troops shoot a gun in basic and you may never see an M16 again. We were also given ill-fitting green helmets marked guard, ill-fitting plain green BDFs and told to follow orders we were to be given in the upcoming briefing. In the briefing we were told we would be guard to special areas and told to check credentials and to only allow people in who had the correct credentials in the military tent areas that were set up what looked to be like perimeter of an area affected by the eruption. We had no idea where we were at. There were no towns or cities around where we were and we arrived there we were about 30 airmen completely and totally confused on what was going on. We slept in a tented area that was near where we worked. We had a mess tent next to the tent where we slept and we didn't leave that area about an acre size for a week or more. Most of us, if not all of us, were guarding areas that people moved into and out of of what looked like victims. The tents we guarded had a foyer area and we couldn't see what was behind the second door. It was brightly lit and you had to go through a couple of partitions to get to the main area of the tent. I assume they were there to prevent peeping into the tents by the guards. It was very infrequent that anyone would walk in and out, and we worked 12-hour shifts only at night. We were used to working 12-hour shifts because this was just after the Iranian crisis, and we would go on alert every three weeks, work 12-hour shifts, flying as many missions as we could, then have a day off, then another alert, and three more weeks of 12-hour shifts for three more weeks. We were told that if anyone tried to breach our area to shoot, that never happened or came close to happening. This was funny to me because we were given one magazine and I don't know if the bullets were real or not. We were Air Force, not Marines. I knew more about a 5 iron than an M16, but nothing ever came up. The only time anyone came up to the area I was guarding only happened after midnight. And it looked to me like a doctor in a white lab coat with either a patient or victim who was wrapped in what looked like overcoats and our night shift navy blue ski caps. You could never see the person who was led into or out of the tents because they had their hands in the coats and were let into the tent by the arm. I think I was there for eight to nine days and it was the most unusual thing I had ever experienced in the Air Force. Last part out of those nights on guard, I noticed two of the people that were escorted in were very, very tall. That's the only thing I noticed that those very tall people, I was not in a position to see how tall they were, but it was obviously that they were over a whole head higher than the doctor, if that's what they were. Only the escort talked and they only mentioned their last name and showed their badge. I don't know if they were army or civilian. The other thing I noticed was that the escorted people, in quotations, were really, really wide, but I always assumed until now that it was the coats that they were wearing. It was very nippy and I also assumed we were at some kind of altitude. After that we were given a debrief that we had helped a lot of the people who were victims, in quotes, of the eruption. That's all we were told, victims, in quotes, and told that we were not to mention this part of our tour of duty. After our last shift, and I don't know how long that was, but it was longer than a week, we were allowed to sleep and the next evening we were allowed to shower. We were only allowed skin baths and washcloths until then in another tent that was behind the latrine tent and chow tent. Given back our original Air Force uniforms and put back on the same bus we rode in and bus back to the same area under darkness. Ferried back to Vancouver Island and back to Comex CFB and we continued our tour of duty as if nothing happened. We did two more weeks of flying sorties with the Canadians, played and drank a, a ton of Canadian beer, Labatt's Blue, and flew in our C-141s back to George Air Force Base. It was all a big mystery on what happened until I read more about the Mount St. Helens creature stories. It seemed similar. They must have really been short on personnel to use a bunch of Air Force kids as guards, or they thought nothing would ever happen. But that's the only time I ever pulled guard duty outside of basic training in San Antonio. So there you go. There's three stories about the Bigfoot bodies and live bodies found after the Mount St. Helens eruption. So you guys let me know what you guys thought about this story. It's very fascinating. Listen, Mount St. Helens has been known since like 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, years ago by the Native American Indians that it was a place you do not go. That they were, it was inhabited by large, huge ape men. I don't think they called them ape men, but omen is what they called them. And uh, yeah, the Indians wouldn't even go to that area. So when Mount St. Helens blew, and if there were those creatures in that area, of course, you know, they were going to be affected by that. And it seems to me that the military, when they flew in there, from these stories, help these Sasquatch out. And, you know, that goes back to the other stories that I've told you about, H.A. Miller and everything, about the government really does know about these creature guys. They really do. They just keep it a secret, in my opinion, because if you guys don't know, remember what they did for the Spotted Owl? How much land they saved just for the Spotted Owl? Now imagine... If they knew that the Bigfoot and the public knew that the Bigfoot was real, which we all know it's real. I know it's real. I have my own encounter. So I, you know, I'm 100% it's real. Just imagine the public pressure to save the areas for these creatures and how much land would be taken away from the public, like as far as use for the lumber industry, farming, all kinds of things. They'd be like, nope, that's completely done. This area is just for these creatures. And you know, another theory of mine is these creatures are very, very big migrators. I don't think that they stay in the same area for like their whole life. To me, they're more like, I thought I read somewhere before, maybe saw this on TV, where male lions have like hundreds and hundreds of square miles in their territory that they patrol. So just imagine on that level, but with Sasquatches, all the areas that they travel into. You know what I mean? Like they're not sitting around in one area, I don't believe. Maybe up some area way up in British Columbia where there's no people or something like that. In some Shangri-La that they have, you know, that no one's around. Maybe they stay in that area. But these areas where people are, I believe they just travel through either seasonally or following food, you know, following food as it, the berries and things become ripe. Or maybe the uh, following the animals through areas also through the seasons. But I do, in my personal beliefs, think that these things... These beasts and these creatures are definitely migrators. They migrate all around. They're not in one location. So having said that, if you're going to save their areas and they migrate those long, huge areas, imagine how much land would be set aside for them. So for all you doubters out there, say, oh, this can't be real. I mean, think about that. Think about what that damage that would do to the United States economy and Canadian economy. I mean, you think it's bad right now with COVID? Like, and it is, believe me, it, it, we all know, but, like, put that on top of it. Like, the construction business, the lumber business, the new home business, a bunch of farming, a lot of hunting here, all that would be done. Done. And so you're going to have a big economic crash if that happens. So it only makes sense to me that the, the government would try to keep this secret as long as possible. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to keep it secret because of all the new technologies with the drones and everybody out there i believe that really soon we're going to find some more evidence besides the roger patterson film some more newer evidence off of a drone or something use your own mind i'm never going to tell you what to believe guys i that's not my job my job is to give you this information try to keep it entertaining keep you entertained and let you guys make up your own minds okay i'm a believer i had my own encounter that's fact. You guys can check out the video. I'll put the link in the description. You guys check out my encounter if you like. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I'm trying to tell you, I know these things are real. I also think they're really, really rare. I think there's maybe 5,000 in all of America and all of Canada. Literally, five to 10,000, and that's it. Now, you think five to 10,000 is a lot, but really, it's not. It's not, guys. That's not a lot at all. You know, with all that wildness out there and all the woods and forest, especially up in Canada, the North Pacific Northwest, even here in Ohio. You know, there are forests down in Ohio that just are like people hardly ever go into. My dad is from West Virginia, and I'm going to tell you guys where my dad is from. He's back from back in the hills, man. And literally, if you go over this one hill, one little mountain that where they live, there's nothing for like 10 miles, of, you know, behind that mountain. It's just nothing but woods and forest, you know, so... 
And West Virginia is completely like that, almost the whole state. If you guys ever see like a map of the United States at night with the electric, look at that little dark spot right there. That's West Virginia. <laughs> there, you know what I mean? So West Virginia has a lot of wild areas. Ohio does. And as you guys know, all of you know the Pacific Northwest has a bunch in Canada. So these creatures have plenty of room. Plenty of room, guys. Everybody that lives in a city like I do, I live, you know, by Cleveland, Ohio. We're all used to like neighborhoods and like, you know, communities. And we're like, no way would there be a big foot around here. Cause you know, we're in the city. But if you go out to the woods, there's all kinds of wilderness out there for these creatures to live. There really is. And anybody that's ever been out, you know what I'm talking about. Anybody that's been out of the city into these wild areas, you know. I don't need to try to persuade anybody. You guys already know. All right, so I've been rambling on long enough. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, make sure you hit that like button for me. If you're new to the channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me. I appreciate it. I'm growing this channel, trying to get it going, get it going, get it rolling. The next video is gonna be something special too. This is going to be a video coming up about a place called Monkey Mountain. And now that's all I'm gonna tell you. It's a place called Monkey Mountain. Oh, I'm gonna give you one more hint. It's not in North America. Yeah, you heard me correct. It's not in North America. So you guys wait to hear this one. It's coming up next. Once again, if you like the video, hit that like button. Leave me some comments. Let me know what you think about these stories I just read to you today. And always remember, guys, like I always say, where there is a will star, there is a way. And we will see you guys later. Take care.